ESPN 1080 The Team presents the ESPN1080.com Insider Show, delivering you the latest news and notes from around the sports world. We got all your local teams covered, including the Knights, the Mets, the Mets, the Rays, the Bucks, and the Knolls. The insiders are your ticket into the press box. And now, here's your insider. And good morning, Orlando. Welcome to the ESPN 1080 Insider Show here on this Sunday morning. Boys and girls, the fastest 60 minutes in sports. Eric Lopez here, your night's insider. Join alongside Carson Engel, back in re- from the abyss. I have returned once again triumphant. Or something like that. Very good. <laughs> and we're also joined by Andrew Melnick, who is uh, guarded in gold proud today. Yeah, nice win yesterday. How um, much did you enjoy Tebow Truth before the show, Andrew? I only heard a little bit of it and came in the studio. Um, <laughs> a, a very historic show, a very historic day here at 1080. You got a Seminole, a Knight, a Hurricane, and a Gator all in the same room. Yeah, fantastic and the stuff. State. And there's no, there's no fights, no arguments. Who's yeah. the Hurricane? our people's insider hello who's yes. coming up fresh off a big win Yay. over syracuse there congrats on that big east win there and of course the fine producer david syracuse. buckman who remains undefeated in the ucf press box i uh, also would like to deem melnick the new magic classic insider that's right magic classic insider is. andrew will break down the magic <laughs> big win over the pistons this week as reggie theus with a monster game i'm, I'm more excited for next this week's uh, episode it's going to be otis smith beating michael jordan and the bulls when he scored 52 that's a big points. you can you can like preview it and then like have everybody watch it and then we can talk about it again i'll tell you if like i preview that game i'm going to be ago. spot on that's you remember that like to hear by the way buckman where can people find us well, uh, you can find us at uh, Insiders1080 um, on Twitter, and then on Facebook, the ESPN1080 Insiders. So, that's a quality. Anywhere show. you type in 1080 Insiders, you'll find us. That's what we like to hear. We got an action-packed show today, ladies and gentlemen. At the bottom of the hour, we'll be about a half hour, about yeah, 25 minutes. We'll be joined by college basketball, former college basketball coach Tom Penders, over 600 wins in his career. Coached at Rhode Island, Texas, most recently at Houston, among places. Very opinionated. If you follow him on Twitter, he has a lot to say about conference realignment. We're going to talk about that and, of course, preview college basketball season, which is less than two weeks away. Yeah, they're playing exhibition games now. I think uh, UCF is scrimmaging Florida this week. Today. Today. Uh, today, clo- a no close scrimmage, un- watch. unfortunately for us. But, yeah, we're seeing a lot of exhibition games. Uh, we got God's gift introduced to the world. <laughs> Yes, that's God's gift to the world, yes. Very good, I like that. Uh, we also are going to preview the LSU-Alabama game, the game of the year. Is it the national championship game, or is it a preview of the national championship game? We'll explain later on the show. But uh, first, let's recap the activities from yesterday. A lot to go. It's a great day if you're a Knights and a Knowles fan, like me, because neither of them gave up a point, and that was beautiful. I enjoyed that very much. Start with UCF. A nice 41 to nothing winner over Memphis and Carson. It's amazing what happens when Jeff Godfrey runs the option and he, he kind of ad-libs and uh, spreads out for nearly oh, that, 100 yards on the ground. Absolutely. I mean, that's what, you know, that, that's the storyline right there, that game, and what we talked about coming into the studio here today. Just watching him play, it looked like what Jeff Godfrey used to do successfully, rolling out of the pocket, making throws on the run, being able to run, you know, really, I mean, he, he, he's run this year, but I don't think he's run as much as he did in 2010. He got to do that yesterday, and that was all they needed to really just take a bad Memphis team and, and just keep them keep them down. I mean, th- that's all you need is, is some successful Jeff Godfrey, kept the defense off the field, the defense was fresh, and they were able to dominate the Tigers. Yeah, I've been complaining about this all year because last year, Jeff Godfrey came in and, you know, they actually changed the offense for him. They went to that spread, read zone option kind of offense. And it really worked all year last year. It's one of the reasons the offense was surprisingly successful last year to go with a good defense, and it's what's been lacking this year. It is, but uh, they got a nice win. Unfortunately for them, Memphis is pretty terrible. Really terrible. Terrible. (laughs) And now starting Thursday, UCF now has to write the gauntlet. They go to host Tulsa, who spanked SMU yesterday. Then they got to go to Southern Miss and at East Carolina. Pretty much got to win out to win the division. But they got explosive Tulsa coming in on Thursday night, which should be an interesting football game. Big game for both sides. Tulsa now 
trying to set up that showdown collision with Houston on Thanksgiving weekend for the Western Division title. Yeah, we were looking at that SMU-Houston-Texas showdown, and ever since that win against UCF, SMU has been, well, terrible. Ten points on offense SMU has scored since, those, uh, since the win over UCF. Yeah, and I can't say that I, that I wasn't a little bit uh, scared watching the way that Tulsa just manhandled them. And so uh, that's not going to be an easy game, and it's a short week, which I think always makes things difficult as well. Short week. Good news for UCF. I think it, actually, this, I think it helps them this week from the standpoint Tulsa's got to travel all the way from Tulsa to Orlando on Wednesday. Uh, so I think that will help them. UCF has had some success with Tulsa recently, that system. But Tulsa's clicking right now. Kenny's healthy. And Tulsa's 5-3. and three. And those three losses yeah. were to Oklahoma, Oklahoma State, and uh, Boise, Boise State. State. Three yeah. top ten teams. Yeah, and they, they scored some points in some of those games. You know, Oklahoma State's defense is less than stellar. But they, they put up some points in those games. Gave up a ton, obviously. But you're talking about three of the, what, five or so best offenses in the country there. Yeah, so that'll be an interesting game. Tulsa-UCF, Thursday night. Uh, as much as we enjoyed the Memphis win, and of course, lots of off-field ish, uh, stories in the, coming out of the UCF Memphis game. Number one, Dwight Howard making an appearance at the game. Yeah, was, acknowledged uh, by the crowd during the first and the second quarter. It took UCF like 500 minutes to like figure out, hey, let's play the Superman song. <laughs> but they figured it out. <laughs> Props to you guys. And Dwight Howard pr- promoting the charity game for the UCF uh, arena in a couple weeks. Yeah, all part of his farewell tour, right? Yes. Oh. oh, that's Andrew Melnick, ladies and gentlemen. It's going to hurt your other work, Andrew. You're, might Howard have the Duck Diet. Yeah, uh, hope, hopefully it doesn't. Hopefully I don't have to change you have, the name. Do you have but... replacement names in, in, in line? No, but you know the guy's not going to get traded. If anything, he's okay. going to walk after a year. Okay. So i got plenty of time to think, and you know, hopefully I won't have to. Down the line, that might have to be a game that we play on this show. Replace Ooh, the like website that. name for Andrew Melnick. How many years have you signed on that website? I mean, do you have the name forever? <laughs> he asked <laughs> our producer, who did not acknowledge that you had a headset on, uh, asked you how long you've had the Howard the Dunk name on. Uh, I actually didn't make it up. Uh, it was it was created by someone else. So uh, it's been there for about three years, though. Eric, can you relay this message as well? Yeah, I can. How much longer it. does he like have on the website? I mean, like five years. So how much longer leaves? do he wants you wants you to keep the website? How long are you you plan on keeping it? Uh. I don't know. <laughs> he doesn't know you. For a while. Never mind. As much as I enjoy this uh, communication, we'll move on. Uh, the next other bit of, uh, bit of story, Carson, is yes. that UCF, Keith Tribble came out, acknowledged UCF in negotiations, 90% done to play at Ohio State next year, September yes. 8, 2012. It's a game that would replace a game at Pittsburgh, because <laughs> Pittsburgh kind of wants out. They have like nine home games scheduled and at this point. And as you said last year, Urban Meyer's second game in Columbus. That's my prediction. Urban Meyer, head coach, Ohio State, second game. That won't be good news for UCF if that's the case. Uh, well, I don't think it's going to be good news anyways, but I don't care. I'm very excited about this game, excited I will be there in Columbus, and uh, basically more excited about that game than anything else in the rest of the football season. So Really? I'm looking ahead to September 8th Woody in Columbus. Woody coaching the team, right? Yeah, but it's, it's, Ohio State. It's, it's, kind it's kind of unfortunate for the Big East, too, because they're, lo- they're losing a bunch of these games. I mean... We yeah, see um, sure. they might lose a Florida State-West Virginia game now that West Virginia's losing because this yeah. was part of the deal. I know you guys are familiar with it. You got you at UCF got their series with USF yeah. because uh, when Conference USA got raided, and this yeah. happened in the Big East and the ACC, no one really talks about it. So we're going to lose that game. Uh, we might lose a Florida State-West Virginia game, games like that, which is kind of unfortunate. Well, that's where college uh, athletics is going. We'll talk to Coach Tom Penders about that uh, later on in the show about that. But, yeah, no, UCF, Ohio State, it's a good deal. Uh, it's probably going to be a one-game deal. They go to Ohio State for all UCF people saying, no, we, they should get return again. No, they don't. No, they don't. No, they don't. They're Ohio State. They do whatever they want. Uh, hopefully, for our sake, if you're UCF, you want Ohio State to keep winning and have Luke Fickle somehow keep that job, even though it's probably a long shot. Otherwise, uh, I think Urban Meyer will be the head coach there. But, nonetheless, uh, that's a good deal for UCF. It's an upgrade, Ohio State over Pitt, right? I think that's a yeah. game that people will be more excited about. It certainly is. Certainly. And, uh, you know, I think we've talked about this a lot off air, Eric, is just getting these, I think, one games that, that are away. You know, we, uh, two for ones. I don't like two for ones. You know, si- signing a deal to have two games at, at, at an opponent's place for one game at, at our place. But I like these one game deals. Uh, against big programs, traditional programs like Ohio State. I think it's a really good move for the athletic program and the football program. So we'll see when they finalize that. And, of course, this week, I see like a broken record, could be the week UCF, SMU, and Houston officially get into the Big East. All, in, uh, all signs is pretty much they're all in already. It's just a matter of 
Do they want to announce UCF, SMU, and Houston without Boise State and Navy and Air Force, or do they want to wait until Boise State, Navy, and Air Force clear itself out? That's the remaining Which question on that situation. shouldn't even matter since we all know what's happening now anyway. Pretty much, yeah. Which we broke this like way before everybody else did. Uh, quick word, Andrew. FSU shuts out NC State, and we want to thank uh, Tom O'Brien for like pushing Russell Wilson to Wisconsin. He'll be thanked for his services probably at the end of what the year. What a moron. But, uh, we take it if we're FSU, right? Uh, we don't need to so, apologize for it, right? Yes, yeah, certainly. <laughs> NC State couldn't move the ball, really, at all. 166 yards of offense, 2.7 yards per play. It was uh, kind of that Florida State defense we saw those first couple weeks that had everyone excited, and then they had the lapses against uh, Clemson and Wake Forest, and now they're starting to look back kind of like the team we thought they'd be early in the year. I mean, their defensive line dominated the game, and that's all you can really ask for, and E.J. Manuel they've been much better since he got healthy. Short week, they go to Chestnut Hill. Uh, Presents some concerns? Yeah, it depends. I saw the low in Boston Thursday night. It's only supposed to be 47, which I'm sure FSU's got to be pretty happy about that. Yeah. Are you going? No. No. Okay. So you I got to I gotta stay in a dual, dual wield with uh, the Tulsa UCF game. You're what? I got to have both games on. So can you I got to keep up on, my, on, this, on the local team. They might can not you be my school, text me updates local since team. I'm working the stats and spotting work for the CBS Sports Network during the UCF Tulsa game? I want you to text Only me Only if it goes well. Fair enough. I don't you don't get, if you don't get texts, it's not going you don't, well. I really don't think it's probably going to go well, but you never know. I hope not. Quick uh, last word before we go to break. The Gators lose to Georgia. First time since 03. They're now 4-4. Four and four. The worst month in the history of Florida Gator football. Longest losing streak since the late 1980s. And all of a sudden now... First SEC, four-game SEC losing streak since the 70s. Yeah. And now they got to worry about just being bowl eligible. Got to go to South Carolina. You got to post Florida State. I can't believe you're saying this. You got to play a Vandy team that's not that's pretty decent and with James Aaron Franklin's Rogers' great little brother. There. Yeah, James Franklin's done a fantastic great job. Great job. Could already. be SEC Coach of the Year. Uh, Should have won a game yesterday, unfortunately. And the worst thing about it is your Florida is if you beat South Carolina, you help Georgia win the SEC. So you're in a no-win situation. Yeah, but if if you're not going to win, I mean, I know Georgia's a rival. But what's the difference? South Carolina, <laughs> Georgia wins. I mean, Florida's eliminated uh, after their loss yesterday, so. Either way, it doesn't really matter. We knew this month was going to be extremely difficult for him. I think we all thought they'd probably be able to pull out at least one, one of these. You were though. hoping for yeah. one. Yeah. Did not happen. But that's okay. Life moves on. Except in Gainesville. That's all we could do. Right, Buckman? Buckman Road is a little depressed today in Gainesville, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, they're a little depressed, I'm sure. But uh, not many people really gave them a chance anyway. So Exactly. It's a rebuilding year for Will Muschamp, Charlie Weiss, and company. Yeah, they should get this first year pass, but who knows if they will. Unbelievable there. So, we'll uh, take this break, and when we come back, we go from the bottom of the SEC to the top in a national title game. Hype. Number one versus number two, Miles Saban, LSU-Bama. Is it the best current rivalry right now in college sports? We'll discuss that and much more. Oh, yes, it is. Oh, yes, it is. We'll tell you why next you're listening to the ESPN 1080 Insider Show on ESPN 1080 The Team. And we welcome you back to ESPN 1080 Insider Show here on ESPN 1080 The Team. Eric Lopez, your Knights Insider, alongside Andrew Melnick, your Magic Insider, still looking for work, so he's a Seminole for the day. Insider every day. Carson Engel here with us. Brian Winninger just hanging out, chilling after a fine job as co-hosting the old school with uh, Roger Williams, talking Tebow Truth last hour. David Buckman producing. Now, we got a big football game this Saturday coming up. LSU and Alabama, one versus two from Tuscaloosa, Saturday night at 8 o'clock. Let's break that game down as uh, Buckman. Who we have first on? We got Ben Love, Tiger Rag, LSU on. Hey, do you want them both at the same time? If we can make it happen, you are the magician, Buckman. You're a magician. Make it happen. Who we got? Ben, you got there? Hey, guys. How you doing this morning? What's going on? Let's talk about the Tigers here. They come in. Uh, your thoughts here as they take on Alabama. This is a, one of the most anticipated games. What's the mood like in Baton Rouge? Um, you know, everyone's just kind of biding time right now. It's, it's a little bit like a Super Bowl type of atmosphere in terms of getting that two weeks of buildup from your last game. You get ready for the Bama game. So a lot of excitement, uh, You know, a lot of, lot of pent-up excitement. People have been waiting now for just over a week, but you know, all the pieces are in place. The two teams come in under exactly what they've been prepping for, getting ready for, and it's just um, it's all about executing the game plan at this point. 
Of course, that's Ben Love from Tiger Egg. We're also now joined by Ken Allen, who's the co-host of the Tracy Dead Show and covers Alabama football, Alabama fan. Uh, Ken, what's the mood like for Alabama in Tuscaloosa? Well, I'm sure it's a pretty good mood. I mean, it's a home game for them, and if you're looking for offense in this game, you definitely uh, won't want to be in Bryant-Denny Stadium because you've got two of the top defenses in the nation, and it's going to be a game where points are going to be at a premium. So special teams could be huge in this game, and field position is going to be everything. Do you guys think, having already played in a hostile road game at West Virginia, LSU is maybe better prepared than the average team who would come in to Tuscaloosa? Ben, you first. I I mean, I really do feel that way, and I've been telling people this uh, last couple of weeks, this particular LSU team, especially guys like Tyron Matthew, and and by the way, those guys are going to play, so obviously reinstated early this week. But those kind of guys, they get up for these big games, and they they really fuel, they're a fuel by those hostile crowds, and they, I mean, you know, you, you should see it in the way that they play, the, the, the amount of trash that takes the word talking at that West Virginia game. But they get excited for that. I really think a team that has a better chance of beating LSU on the road is a, an early game with kind of a sleepy crowd, and, and they really don't have all that, that kind of stuff in the peripheral. But you know, with this game in prime time, on the road, for all the marbles, uh, I don't think coming out flat would be a problem for LSU. Ken, how do you feel about that? Is LSU maybe a little tougher tested than Bama? Oh, I would say they probably have played better competition than Alabama, but neither one of these teams has been challenged in the second half late, so we don't know what, what these teams are going to do when you know you get to the fourth quarter and it's tied or a one-possession game or whatnot, so it'll be interesting. I think that you know Alabama playing at Florida and having a Florida score on the first play of the game to put them behind 7 nothing and have that place erupt, I think that they uh, know that a crowd really doesn't mean anything, so... I don't think once the game starts that the crowd will have that big of an effect on LSU because they're just going to be focused on what they have to do one play at a time against the guy they're playing against, and that's why these defenses are so good. You know, they don't let any outside influences bother anything of what their plan is for the game, and that's to shut down the run and say, if you can beat us, you better throw it. I want to get both of your thoughts on this, and I guess we'll start with Ken. With both teams having the week off, uh, make your case. Wh- which team does that favor more? Is there a team that, that has it, either Alabama or LSU that, that gets more of an advantage uh, with both of them having that week off? I, I think the week off really helps them both. You know, last year Alabama played six SEC opponents who had an open week before they played. LSU was one of those, and they won that game last year 24-21. If they had had to play the week before, I'm not sure they win the game, but, you know, that's just, it is what it is. But I think this gave them a chance to really focus on the opponent and come up with any wrinkles offensively or defensively that they want to put into this game because it is so huge. And as I mentioned earlier, points are going to be at a premium. So I think the, uh, the off week has helped both teams, and it would be the same as if both teams had had a game beforehand. I want to get both of your no, thoughts on I want to get both of your thoughts on I, I kind of I agree with Ken a little bit. I'm not sure you can say it favors one team either way, but here's the, here's the case for LSU at least. They get... Center P.J. Lonergan back since the last two games with an ankle injury, so it gives them a little more time to get ready. And, and without him and on that offensive line, they're a lot worse off having to keep Bob Aver inside. And they'll also get Ken Adams back at the defensive end and dealing with the strange MCL. So that's, I guess, the case for LSU. And then these three suspended players, obviously they get an extra week to get back into the game shape after missing the, the Auburn game. I want to get both of your thoughts on this, whether it's maybe Ruben Randall on the outside or some matchup in the interior. What do you, the two of you think the most important individual matchup in the game is? Wow. Uh, you know, uh, if you're talking about, go ahead, Ken. I was just going to say, if you're talking about an individual player, I don't know that there is one specific individual player. I think for both teams, it's going to be how well their offensive line can withstand the defensive pressure from the defensive line that they're going to face. I say, you know, for me, it, it, it kind of goes back to what Ken said earlier. Neither team has really been tested a lot in the second half. And LSU, I mean, in the fourth quarter of all eight games, has been able to run, run, run. So I firmly believe this game is eventually going to come down to Alabama forcing LSU to beat them in the air late in the game. So from that standpoint, I guess, you know, an individual matchup would maybe be uh, a lot of the, the secondary members and, and Jared Lee. And can they bait him into throwing the wrong ball? Because Jared obviously still has that in his pedigree. Or could Jared's done what he's done the majority of the season and just be efficient passing the football? Uh, guys, I'll ask you this, and Ben, I'll start with you. Ben, I want you to tell us what is the biggest thing that concerns LSU about Alabama, and then can I, uh, you'll follow by asking what's the biggest thing that concerns you about LSU. Uh, ben, you start. 
Uh, you know, to me, the biggest thing that concerns me, and it's, it's hard not to say Trent Richardson here because he's really a heck of a player. With Lattimore out, I think he's the best back in the SEC. But the thing where I'm going to go is what concerns me the most is the linebacker play uh, at Alabama. LSU's defense is very fast. They're, you know, they can wreak havoc, but they don't have linebackers like Alabama does. Just with, with what Courtney Upshaw can do, rushing the passer. Uh, obviously, Hightower, phenomenal player. I just, you know, those guys cover so much ground, and if they're able to stop LSU's running game from a base, package without having to get a lot more people in the box, it's going to be a long day for LSU if they can do that. So for me, it's all it's Alabama linebackers. Ken, what's the biggest thing that scares you about LSU? Oh, I think it's uh, pretty close to what Ben just said. I think, I think if they, if LSU can shut down Alabama's run and make it go to the hands of McCarron, our quarterback, and, and he has to win the game, uh, that scares me a bit that uh, we'd have to put it on his shoulders. But uh, if Alabama is able to run the ball, and can maybe use some play action, I think uh, that is an advantage for the Crimson Tide. As for our defense, if we can uh, shut down LSU's run and make Jarrett Lee beat us, I think that's the advantage. So it really may come down to quarterback play, as we said it would in the Florida game. So I, I think that uh, the ability of LSU to shut down Alabama's run game and forcing uh, McCarron to be the guy that actually wins the game uh, could be the, the big key in this game. Last question for both of you. Uh, ben, I'll start with you. Give me one key to the game that a week from today people maybe – right now people are not talking about, but a week from today we're talking about, and it prevails to victory. Uh, I'll give you two, and both of these are big contributors to the LSU wins game week in and week out. The first one is the turnover margin. they got one of the best in the country. LSU's only thrown uh, one interception all season long. They've lost a couple of fumbles. I think they've had three total turnovers to eight games. So. LSU's outstanding in that uh, department. If they could do that again, they got a good chance to get the win. The second one is the field position. And, you know, a freshman punter in Brad Wing, I, I think most people probably know him best for his celebration against Florida, but really the guy's a heck of a punter. He averaged two yards a punt against Auburn when he was called upon. So if LSU can win field position battles and turnover battles, I think that's what we'll be talking about a week from now. Ken, what's your key? Uh, the key is Alabama's number four, and it's either special teams or defense. I think a special team punt return by Marquise Mays could be the difference in the game or a pick six by Mark Barron because Jarrett Lee, when he throws interceptions, at least when he had was prone to throw them, six of those or eight of those, I would think, last year, the year before, got returned for scores. So this is going to be a key. So I either say Mark Barron uh, returns a pick six for a touchdown or we get a special teams punt return score by Marquise Mays. So either one of the fours will be the difference in the game. That's Ken Allen, the co-host of the Tracy Dent Show, Fridays 1 to 3 right here on ESPN 1080. And, of course, Ben Love from Tiger Rag. Ben, tell the audience where they can find Tiger Rag. Absolutely. Go to TigerRag.com. You can get a subscription there. We also have good free information on the website. Also, BayouBengalsInsider.com. We have a bundle with a great recruiting service. So if uh, LSU Sports Recruiting is what you need, go to BayouBengalsInsider.com. Beautiful. Guys, Take uh, enjoy this. Uh, enjoy the game uh, a week from tonight. Who knows? We might do this again in January night for a rematch, right? It's a possibility, right? <laughs> Could be. Outside chance. Outside chance. All right, guys, have a good day. That's Ben Love and Ken Allen and boys. It's going to be great next Saturday night, huh? Yeah, I like them pointing out the punter. I mean, in a game like this, make a good point. We take you inside the games. I think right now, you look at the last five years, I'm not talking about all time, but right now, right now, it's all about LSU, Alabama, Nick Saban, Les Miles, two great stadiums, two great fan bases, the two best programs going today. And I think could be a a first of two games. This kind of reminds me of Florida, Florida State in the mid-90s, Andrew, with Spurrier and Bowden going at every year. That 96 year, they played twice for the, you know, one for the National Tower, Florida hosed FSU. Could happen again this year? Uh, yeah, I think we need to get a little more consistency. Uh, I mean, last year we saw a game that was virtually not meaningless, I don't want to say, but, you know, it was a game that didn't matter in the, in the broad spectrum of things in the West. It's going to be fun. LSU, Bama, ladies and gentlemen, 8 o'clock Saturday night, 1 versus 2. It's always fun when those two go at it. <laughs> All right, we're going to take a break. When we come back, we'll be joined by former college basketball coach Tom Penders. We will talk about the realignment in college athletics and college basketball. That's next here on ESPN 1080 Insider Show on ESPN 1080, the team.
the most outstanding deal in golf, the Alliance Club and Gold VIP membership plans have combined. Marriott's Gold VIP membership offers an opportunity to now play five of the top courses in Orlando, all for a very low price. The Marriott Gold VIP membership offers prime golfing experiences at the Marriott Managed Properties. Join today for just $75 until the end of the year and get a free round of golf. Have access to Grand Pines, the Faldo Golf Institute, Falcons Fire, Metro West, and Hawks Landing for prices as low as $29. No matter which course you choose to play, Gold VIP members also receive discounts for practice and inside the pro shops. Also receive unlimited daily play specials and rewards benefits. Marriott's brand new Gold VIP membership program is the best deal in town. Log on to MarriottGolf.com, Florida Course Directory, or call the participating pro shops at Grand Pines, the Faldo Golf Institute, Falcons Fire Golf Club, Metro West Golf Club, or Hawks Landing Golf Club to sign up today. Hey, we welcome you back to the ESPN 1080 Insider Show. Eric Lopez alongside Andrew Melnick and Carson Engel. Buckman producing. Lots going on in college athletics. Realignment changes are going on. West Virginia is going to the Big 12. UCF, SMU, and Houston reportedly will be going officially to the Big East as early this week. And a person who has been very vocal about that and, and a tremendous, uh, knows all about college athletics. He's a coach at Rhode Island, Texas. And Houston, over 600 wins in his career, made the NCAA tournament many, many times. Uh, tremendous honor. He's also been an analyst for Westwood One and ESPN. It is an honor to be joined now by Coach Tom Penders now joining the ESPN 1080 Insider Show. Coach, uh, welcome. Hey, how's it going? Great. Give me your, your thoughts. I know you've been very vocal on Twitter about this whole realignment expansion. Your thoughts on this whole situation. Where are we headed in college athletics? Well, I think eventually you're going to see the Super Conference. Uh, set up where you've got four leagues with 16 teams. Now, that may not uh, happen in the next year or two, maybe three or four years, but I think that's what we're headed for. I, I just read recently where Mike Krzyzewski, uh, was may have been in an ESPN.com piece, said this very same thing. I've, I've been talking about this now for at least six months, and, uh, you know, it's starting to take its shape now uh, I'm not sure who those four conferences are going to be but it makes a lot of sense to me you know in terms of scheduling in terms of a conference and I don't know what the playoff situation is going to be for basketball football etc uh, but I think you're going to see eventually another thing you know <laughs> which would be the greatest thing for football fans is to get rid of that stupid BCS and have a you know have a playoff system in football. Yeah, that's what we're all hoping for, Coach. When when you look at we had a super conference in the Big East at least basketball wise. They've now lost three teams. Do you think the ACC has kind of taken that handle or is going to w with getting Pittsburgh and Syracuse back from the Big East as the best conference in the country? Yeah, I think they you know they're the most aggressive so far. They've been you know quiet about it, but. You know, they, they also, uh, I think, can see into the future. They've got an aggressive uh, conference commissioner who I've got a lot of respect for. He was the athletic director at North Carolina. I know everybody's talking football, football, because there's a lot of money in it. But the basketball tournament could end up being even more lucrative uh, in the future. And the ACC has always been, you know, one of the elite conferences. I mean, since the 70s, uh, you know, the, the ACC has been on average the strongest. I know the Big East has gotten better and better. Now with this shakeup with teams leaving and teams coming in, schools coming in, um, you know, it may take a while for the Big East to get as strong basketball-wise, but if they – stay together, and they somehow can find a way to make it all work, which is not an easy thing, you know, with with all the different schools, different makeups of schools, not a lot of commonality in that conference, but, you know, if, if people can get over that uh, and the football people uh, can have their own little deal as well, it looks confusing now, and it's scrambling around right now, but you know, with the addition of, of Central Florida, with the addition of Houston and SMU, those those programs are going to grow. They're going to get better. Um, you know, they've been in Conference USA, uh, uh, a little smaller league. Now there's much exposure. 
But arguably this year you can look at Conference USA football and say that, you know, at least two teams could be highly competitive, if not at the very top of the Big East. You know, I think Houston is one of the most uh, best-kept secrets in the country. And, you know, they put on a show the other night with 73 points against Rice. Absolutely. Uh, talking here with former college basketball coach Tom Penders. Coach, I'm wondering to kind of get your thoughts, and I've seen some of them on Twitter about Notre Dame. It seems like Notre Dame's sort of a key piece in all of this, and the fact that they've sort of held out from joining a conference for everything has, I think, sh sort of shifted the landscape and what we're seeing now in terms of everyone forming into super conferences. Yeah, they are. I mean, they could just they could say right now or next week, uh, well, we're going to stay with the Big East. They've been so great to us in all of our sports. And, you know, we're real comfortable with all of our sports. We're able to compete for championships with all of our sports. Uh, it, it would seem to me to be <laughs> more than cheesy. I think it would uh, be rotten if they took off and went to another conference. Mm -hmm. uh, I just, you know, there's a lot of reasons why Notre Dame is a great fit for the Big East. One is their market. Their market goes, in my opinion, it's an East Coast, Midwest type team. It's not so big in California. It's not big in you know some of the other states or parts of the country. Uh, Notre Dame's name, their fans, you know, they're they're all over. But most of them are centered in the East. So for them, it makes sense. Uh, I'm sure that the the much talked about television deal can remain intact. It was theirs before they went into a conference. It should be theirs to keep uh, for as long as they're contracted. It doesn't matter. Nobody's getting money other than Notre Dame from their TV contract. And uh, why should they if Notre Dame joined their league? At least uh, eventually it may happen because Notre Dame has become irrelevant. I mean, I used to love to watch Notre Dame back in the, you know, 60s when I was really young and 70s and 80s. But now that everybody has gone to conferences they are irrelevant in my eyes mm -hmm. and uh, who cares what bowl game they go to I can't remember the last time they were an important bowl game uh, because of their independence they don't play an attractive schedule they play all the service academies and and they've got about nine automatic wins before the the season even starts <laughs> and you know, I, I, I can't develop an interest in it, and I don't care about anything. I like to watch good football. I love college football. I probably saw bits and pieces of about 15 games yesterday. And, uh, you know, Notre Dame right now to me is irrelevant. Uh, the only way they can become relevant is to get into a competitive conference, and I'd love to see them do it. I think that, you know, they would show themselves to be a lot less uh, greedy by getting into a conference. I agree. Uh, talk about, obviously, these programs you know very well. UCF, you competed against SMU, and, of course, Houston, you coached there. What do they bring to the Big East, and what should those schools in particular expect from the Big East in football, and specifically basketball, where I think UCF and Houston, they're going to benefit from an attendance standpoint with more marquee matchups with games like Notre Dame in basketball, potentially Marquette, Louisville, et cetera. Uh, what, what do you think of that match? Exactly. You're right. I mean, the, if, if you're down in football or, you know, you're having a bad year, you know, rebuilding, whatever, maybe UCF's in that category this year, uh, you're not going to have as many of those years when you're in a big conference because recruiting becomes a lot easier when you're going to homes in Florida and, you know, you're on television every week. You're going to be playing schools that everybody knows about. Uh, Houston in the basketball area uh, is going to improve. It's a tough job right now. I mean, it's hard to recruit kids. You know, they, they grow up. Let's face it. Kids grow up watching the Big East. They grow up watching the ACC more than any two conferences in the country. They're on all the time on ESPN. So when you're recruiting for basketball, you can tell a kid he's going to be on TV. You're going to be competing for national championships. Your level of recruiting is going to jump right up. 
of course, I've always believed, you know, in the, in the modern ages, starting in the in the late '80s, if you can't recruit nationally, you have no shot at, at becoming a big time program in today's world. It used to be, you know, if Chicago schools stuck in Chicago where they're recruiting, and then you know, look what happened to DePaul. They've become kind of irrelevant because they did that. If you can recruit nationally today, you can compete nationally. Now, in football, Central Florida, most of their kids are going to come from, you know, the, the state of Florida because it's a huge football state. And football for Houston, most of their kids are going to come from the state of Texas, but maybe not all from Houston. Maybe there are kids in Dallas and Fort Worth and some of the bigger cities and are also going to cherry-pick kids. If you go to the Big East and you, you can't recruit New York, New Jersey, and maybe even Washington, then you're not going to be competitive in the Big East. You can't just stick with one area of the country. But that's, you know, look at UConn. I cannot remember, uh, you know, they've, they've, they've been the main power since 1999. They've won three national championships. And I can't remember the last time one of their star players came from the state of Connecticut. And that's a very good high school basketball situation in Connecticut. We're on here on the Insider Show with former college basketball head coach Tom Penders. Coach, I'm wondering, you know, obviously you look at it on paper right now, the, the moves for these CUSA teams to the Big East seems like a good idea on paper. But what happens to these programs if we see more poaching and the landscape does go to four 16-team conferences? Where does that leave schools like UCF, SMU, and Houston? Well, I think they can go to 16, too. I mean, you know, they're going to be some shakeups. There's going to be some movement. Where is Kansas going to go if there's another shakeup or a shift in the in the Big Twelve? You know, it's a great program. I believe that you know if if it all fell apart in the Big Twelve this year, and that's a conference that's extremely volatile and will remain so if Texas is going to be making twice as much money from television and other contracts as any other school. And that eventually is going to kill that conference. You, you can't have that unless, you know, it's a Notre Dame situation where Notre Dame came in with a contract, a, a different television contract. That has to be honored. You, you can't expect Notre Dame to break its contract, uh, which it made, you know, with NBC long before, you know, the Big East thought about having them. But... I, I don't, it's a little bit of a gamble. If, if you don't take a, a gamble, if you're afraid to make steps, then, you know, no blue chips uh, will ever come your way. You know, you can't get in a in a high-end million-dollar poker game with $25. <laughs> you got to put some money up. You want to make money, you better put up money, and this is the time to do it. Uh, obviously, Texas A&M, Missouri, heading over to the SEC. This is a football move. You know, we were talking about football earlier. But how much more viable of a basketball conference does that make this this league now? I mean, we've got three teams in the preseason, the AP Top Ten with uh, Vanderbilt, Florida, and Kentucky. How much better does that make this basketball league? Are we going to see them going from four or five big le bid league to maybe six, seven, eight bid league? I believe so. I think the, the SEC is, is strengthening itself, and Texas A&M, it's been a really solid basketball team now for, oh, six, eight years, and and they are going to get better. I mean, they're going to be able to recruit outside of Texas. They're going to be able to, you know, get kids in the entire SEC area. Uh, it just opens up your recruiting. Having Central Florida in the conference, uh, the Conference USA, has helped coaches go in and, and get players from Florida. We did it at Houston. They can come into Texas and get players from Texas. It just broadens your whole recruiting scope because the television sets are going to be pointed toward that conference. And you're going to find kids growing up, again, wanting to play in your conference, whether it's the Big East, the SEC, the ACC, the Pac-12 out on the other side. Uh, you know, I, I just think it's going to grow and grow but if you're not in one of those conferences, it's going to be awfully difficult, you know, to have a broad-based athletic program that can be nationally competitive. 
Coach, uh, it's going on the court this season. What's your thoughts on Conference USA, how it shakes out this season? Well, you know, you've got, obviously, Memphis is the, you know, the major talent team, uh, but they proved last year that they can be beaten. They just got hot at the end of the conference season, and uh, UTEP just, you know, handed the game over to them in the last, you know, in the championship game. It should have been, uh, you know, probably UTEP's to win last year. Now they're rebuilding. I like Central Florida. I think they've got a shot. They had a taste of the top 25 last year. You know, most of those players are back. Uh, they've got a pretty solid backcourt. To me, the backcourt is, is crucial. I don't care how good your front court is. Central Florida has a very good front court. Their backcourt's got to be more consistent. They've got to be more productive on a continuous basis. Um, you know, it's, it's really hard to see. You know, Marshall looked very good to me last year. I saw them in person. I'll see them again. Uh, you know, it's hard to, to tell who those other ones are going to be. I liked, uh, as an improving program last year, Rice. Rice, uh, you know, they beat Houston twice. They lost, I think, three or four overtime games to other conference schools. Tulsa looks to be very solid again. Uh, there are no real big heavyweights there aside from, from uh, Memphis on paper, but it's still a young learning coach at the helm. And, you know, their, their window to be beaten is still there for other ball clubs. Uh, you know, he's in his third year now. That's Josh Pastner. You know, I look back when I was in my third year, I was, you know, I was at Tufts University up in Boston making more mistakes than I want to admit. Uh, but, you, you know, you don't become, you know, John Calipari or a high-profile, highly visible coach in your third year. Last uh, bit before we let you go, uh, you're on Twitter now. You, uh, Tom Penders, people can find you on Twitter. you got your own website uh, as well, TomPenders.com. And you wrote a book recently, Dead Coach Walking. Tell us about the book you wrote. Well, the book uh, "Dead Coach Walking" is is part, you know, my story as a as a as an athlete at UConn and evolving into a, a college coach. And the rest of the book, the the other half of the book, is about problems and issues in the NCAA, uh, and also topics like officiating, like athletic directors how it's all changed from the 70s, early 70s when I started as a college coach to what it has become now. In some areas, I'm sorry to say I was dead on right about some of the scandals and what's going on. seems like this last year, uh, you know, sad to say I, I was a soothsayer about some of these things that are happening with the NCAA and, and some of the scandals that have evolved, you know, the thing at Miami. Uh, you know, are there going to be more of those? That absolutely is the answer. Uh, there's so many things the NCAA has to concern itself with, and it's all in the book. And I not only talk about the problems, I talk about the solutions, you know, dealing with the AAU people. Uh, you know, and I know UCF has got a little problem of its own right now, but <clears throat> I'll be surprised if it isn't or somebody from the AAU isn't involved in this thing. Well, a fantastic read. I encourage people to go look it up. Go to TomPenders.com for more information. Follow Coach Penders on Twitter as well, Tom Penders. Coach, it has been an honor to have you on the show. We want to have you back on during the college basketball season, and we'll go more on the court stuff during the season, Coach. Yeah, I can't wait for it to start. It looks like a great year for college basketball and hopefully for Conference USA and UCF. Absolutely, Coach. Have a great day, Coach. You too. That's Coach Tom Penders, former coach, 600 over 600 wins, coached at Rhode Island, Texas, and Houston. I think he's a he's a UCF guy, huh? I'm kind of fired up right now. You're fired up. Look at you. You're 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 got like a big glee in your eye. I am. I'm very he's, excited. He's a recruiter. He knows how to play to you, Orlando. This Orlando crowd. How? Which uh, be great stuff. I told you he's very opinionated. And boy, yeah. he shared his thoughts. I, I had to get him on. No well, Notre Dame. I had to yeah, get him on I, Notre Dame. I know I he's hope been the very. Irish fans weren't listening today. <laughs> I, I know he's been very outspoken against them on Twitter, and a lot of people have. And so I thought that was a good topic to hit on on with him for for sure. Uh, unbelievable. Very pro UCF. Thinks UCF can compete uh, in the conference. He likes the backcourt. Yeah. Likes Mar. Obviously, he's talking about Marcus Jordan, Ramsa. 
Uh, it's a little it was surprising to uh, hear what he, he had wants to say about it. He wants him to be consistent. Right. He wants him to be consistent, which is, I think is very fair. That's, that's a huge point, especially in conference play, which is probably most of what he saw. He probably watched a lot of those Conference yeah. USA games, and both of those guys were very inconsistent. Obviously, Ramsey got benched at one point from point guard. Uh, Marcus Jordan was you know, on one night scoring off the next. So those two guys, I mean, their consistency night in and night out can make UCF basketball a much better team than, than they were last year if they if they are consistent. Yeah, they got to be healthy, too. I mean, once Marcus kind of got hurt there, right. he didn't have that same explosiveness that he had earlier in the year, and that's kind of when things started to fall apart. Uh, he likes the front court, so obviously he likes Clanton. I was surprised. He's very, that, yeah, that's my very question. But he, yeah. he, I don't think he thinks that that matters as much in today's college basketball, which I guess is a valid uh, point, too, that maybe the front court, you know, a lot of teams are looking for those front court guys and, and don't, don't really have them, especially when you look at a conference like Conference USA. Well, you win titles in college basketball with point guard play. Yeah, I think that's become pretty obvious. Absolutely, uh, we will have that Tom Penders yeah, interview we're have to cut that. up on the yeah, website ESPNFlorida.com, ESPN1080.com. Uh, look for that this week. A fantastic stuff with him, and uh, we'll hopefully have him on again. And in a great book, talks about all the stuff going behind the scenes in college athletics, AAU basketball. He's dead on. Yeah. It's really sure. an underlying issue in basketball. So, uh, fantastic stuff. Uh, we segue quickly here, boys. Yeah, uh, we, we only got a couple minutes. we gotta, we got to say it's something hard, about, about hard the NFL. Segue. Hard segue. It's hard it's, segue. It's but it's Sunday. great stuff, and I want to thank Buckman as well. Great job cutting out. You got Ken Allen on today. Had Ben Love on in this top preview in LSU, Alabama, and then Tom Penders on. Uh, great show, huh? Buckman, by the way. Your Giants, just because you had a great show, I want, I'm going to root for the Giants to blow out my Dolphins today. That's how I oh, appreciate no, it. You're, you're rooting for that because you want Andrew Luck. Don't don't yeah. 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 Lopez. Yeah. I don't want to be don't mean give to there. I don't want to be mean to, to, to David, but this is the kind of game the Giants always kind of screw up. They're going to lose. You better not. No, lose. you don't. No, you don't. You better not. <laughs> Whenever they play these much, much better teams, they seem you to play down to game, opponents. It, I don't know. We'll fire you or something. I don't know. Wow. We'll bring in Brittany to produce next week if the Giants Ooh. lose. You know what? I'll, I'll, I'll get a little extra sleep. and uh... <laughs> uh, We're just rooting against our team. All right, but I, I got a question for the two of you. Yes. We've we got to do something in NFL here. We do. Either one of you see an upset? Uh, no. A big upset today? <laughs> no, I hope not. I hope the Giants beat the Dolphins pretty well. Uh, Pittsburgh, New England, obviously, is the marquee game of the day. LaRoffelsberger, Brady, should be fun. Yeah, I don't uh, even call that an upset if Pittsburgh plays right. that way. We got two and a half Is New England points, really right? favored in Pittsburgh? That's yeah, it actually went up to three the other day. I almost now am worried that everybody's picking New England. So I might go with Pittsburgh. Oh, there's the music. We won't be able to talk T-Bow Lions. That's a shame. Well, we, we can mention it. All right, go Lions. All right, so there's your mention. <laughs> on that note. After the greatest performance in sports history that Timmy put Absolutely. on last week right, in man, Miami. Beat the Dolphin defense. Great job. So that's Andrew Melnick, your Magic Classic Insider. He'll break down Reggie Theus' big win. Nice. Otis Smith against Jordan next week. Otis Smith. Carson Engel here. Buckman, the people's running back, Victor Anderson. Congre uh, tough break with Rollins losing. I'm Eric Lopez. We'll see you next week. Another edition of ESPN uh, 1080 Insider Show on ESPN 1080. The team.